Hello everyone, I'm Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experiment Designs for Computer Science, Week 3, Statistical Inference. Last video I explained to you what is the procedure of statistical inference and in this video I will explain to you how to calculate it. Let's go! So in the last video we talked about the procedure for the new hypothesis testing. The idea is that we select a new hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis, and from the experimental data, we try to decide which one we think is more probable. To be more precise, what we want to do is answer the question. Do we have enough evidence to prefer the alternate hypothesis to the new hypothesis? To answer this question, we want to calculate the statistic in our hypothesis, let's say x, and see if the probability of these statistics to have happened to have the absurd value is low enough under the new hypothesis that we have to reject the new hypothesis. So let me repeat because this is important. We calculate the statistic, for example, the mean weight. Then we calculate the probability of this statistic under the new hypothesis. Finally, based on this value, we reject the new hypothesis if this probability is low enough. In other words, if the value of the statistic is too unlikely under the model defined by the new hypothesis. By this definition, we have to define a expected region, which is the region where the value of the statistic has high probability under the new hypothesis, and a rejection region, where the value of the statistic has a low probability under the new hypothesis. So, let's consider the possible results of a hypothesis test. In the last slide, we considered two possible results. One, the estimate value under the new hypothesis falls in the expected region. This means that the probability of this value is high, so we do not reject the new hypothesis. Two, the estimate falls in the reject region. This means that the probability of this value under the new hypothesis is too low, so we reject the new hypothesis. However, you must remember that there is an error associated with our estimate. The true value that we are trying to calculate can be different from the value that we actually estimated. This makes us consider two more possible results. Three, the estimated value falls in the rejection region, but the new hypothesis is actually correct. This is a type 1 error. It usually happens because the error in our estimator is too large, or if we are too strict with this delta here, which determines the error threshold of the expected region. Four. The estimate falls in the expected region, but the new hypothesis is not correct. This is a type 2 error. This can happen because the error of the estimator is large, but it can also happen if we are too, too generous with the size of the expected region. During the experiment design stage, it's possible to choose the parameters of our experiment to control the size of the rejection region and limit the probability of error to a certain degree. So let's talk a little bit about these two errors in more detail. So let me give you a little bit more detail on type 1 error. Type 1 error happens when your estimate tells you to reject the new hypothesis while the new hypothesis is true. Type 1 error is a false positive kind of error. We describe the probability of a type 1 error as alpha. Sometimes we also say that alpha is the significance of the test. Finally, we can also say that the test has a confidence of 1 minus alpha percent. Let's think about what this means from a statistical point of view. Remember that the statistic that estimates a parameter is a random variable. So, there is a distribution that describes 
the possible values that we can find when we calculate the estimate. From this point of view, alpha, the probability of type 1 error, is equivalent to the probability that a value from this distribution falls in the rejection region. If we understand the distribution of the estimate, we can control alpha by changing the size of the rejection region. For example, if we assume that our estimate follows a normal distribution with mean equal to the true value, in other words, it's an unbiased estimator. So we can calculate delta, which is the size of the rejection region, so that the probability of the estimate to be inside it is alpha. This is equivalent to this blue size of this image. Now let's think about the type 2 error. A type 2 error, false negative, happens when the null hypothesis is not true, but our estimate falls inside the acceptable area. It's represented by the letter beta. Another name for the type 2 probability is power of the test. Another name for the type 2 probability is power of the test. 1 minus beta is the power of the test. We can think about the type 2 error in terms of distributions of probabilities for the estimate, in the same way that we did for the type 1 error. However, it's a bit, little bit harder to control the probability beta than it is the probability alpha. This is because when we try to calculate the area of the estimate distribution that corresponds to a false negative, we need to take into consideration the true value of the parameter, which we don't know. So in this image here, the blue distribution is the probability distribution of the estimate under the null hypothesis. We control, this, we control the null hypothesis, so we control this distribution which is fixed. The red distribution, however, is the true distribution. It could be really close to the null hypothesis distribution, like here on the top figure, or it could be very far away, like in the bottom figure. So under the same design, the true value of beta of the power of the test can vary a lot. In the top case, beta is really high, so the power is really low. In the bottom case, beta is really low, so the power is really high. So the power of the experiment can change because of many factors. Some of these factors we control, some we don't. The factors that we control include the significance level alpha, and the size of the sample. The factors that we don't control include the true value of the parameter and the variance of the data. In general, it's possible to estimate the power of a test by determining a target minimum difference between the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. So we can say that if the difference between the null hypothesis and the true value is at least this much, then the probability of a type 2 error is better. So to summarize the errors, type 1 error, alpha, is the significance of the test and it depends on the distribution described by the new hypothesis. Type 2 error, beta, is the power of the test and depends also on the real value of the parameter, which we don't know. Alpha is easier to control than beta and because of this difference in the difficulty to control the alpha and beta, we consider that when a test rejects the new hypothesis, it's a strong conclusion, but when a test does not reject the new hypothesis, it's a weak conclusion. Another way to put this is that failing to reject the new hypothesis is not evidence that the new hypothesis is true. That's why I have been saying failing to reject the new hypothesis and not accepting the new hypothesis, because it's a weak result. It only says that the, that the new hypothesis is better than the alternate hypothesis that we proposed. Okay, so now that we understand how to interpret the result of the hypothesis test, let's review the steps to conduct the test. First, we identify the parameters that we are trying to estimate, so let's say the mean, 
Then we define two hypotheses and the desired alpha and beta values. Next, we define the minimal size of interest, delta, which we'll talk about in a second. And then using these parameters, we will calculate the sample size, which we'll talk about near the end of the course. With all these values decided, we can calculate the statistic for the test and the critical region, the reject region for the new hypothesis. After we calculate the rejection region, we can obtain the data from the experiment, calculate the test statistic, and decide from the result if we should reject the new hypothesis or not. Let's consider an example of calculation of the hypothesis test. The idea here is similar to the chocolate factory example. There is a brand of peas, and you are a consumer that wants to check if the weight of the bag of peas is different from the amount that is used in the bag. So let's assume that we know the true variance of the production distribution. In this case, we can define the new hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis as new hypothesis, mu equals to 50 kilos, alternate hypothesis, the true mean of the weight is not 50 kilos. Note that in the alternate hypothesis, the true mean value could be more than 50 or less than 50. This is what we call a two-sided test. Let's consider that the desired significance of the test is 0.05. And when I say desired significance, I mean we choose the significance value. We choose the significance value based on the reason for which we're doing the experiment. Okay? <clears throat> so, our model assumes that the sample distribution of our estimator, mean of the weight, which we represent here by bar x, is a normal curve, with variance sigma squared divided by the sample size. If the null hypothesis is true, the mean of, the, 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 uh, the mean of this distribution is 50. We can use these numbers to calculate the test statistic Z0. This is calculated with the simple form, x bar minus mu0 divided by sigma divided by square root of n. This formula transforms the value of x bar, our calculated statistic, follow, uh, into a variable Z0 following a normal distribution with mean 0 and standard error 1. If we think about the cumulative density function of the normal curve, the value of Z0 falls within the alpha quantile of the normal distribution with probability 1 minus alpha. This allows us to calculate our critical zone. If Z0 is smaller than the alpha by 2 percentile of the normal or greater than 1 minus alpha divided by 2 percentile, then we reject the new hypothesis. Otherwise, we fail to reject the new hypothesis. Let's replace these variables with some numbers to make it easier to understand. Let's say that we have 10 observations and the average that we calculated is 49.65. Then let's assume that the standard error is one kilo. We put these variables, these values in the equation from the last page, and the value of z is minus 1.113. Now, remember that our critical region is, is defined by the percentile values of a normal curve. We have an alpha equal to 0 0.05, but we want to use it above and below the, no the, the curve, so we divide it by 2. So we have two values, and these values will be uh, the 0,025 percentile of z, which is minus 1.96, and the 0,975 percentile of z, which is 1.96. So in this case, because of the value of z0 is minus 1,13 falls between these two values, uh, we do not reject the new hypothesis. So in this case, the data does not support the rejection of the new hypothesis. If this z value fell outside of this interval, then we would conclude that we can reject the new hypothesis. <clears throat>
Now, let's imagine another situation, a little bit more realistic, where we don't know the real variance of the data. Also, let's assume that we want a more strict test. So we set our confidence to 99% or alpha equal to 0.01. In this case, our test statistic changes from Z0 to T0. T0 is a test statistic calculated from the student t-test distribution uh, with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So, because we don't know the, the, the variance of the, of, the uh, of the system, we use a t-distribution that takes into account this lack of information. In this equation, s is the error calculated from the sample, and t d is the t distribution with d degrees of freedom, in this case n minus 1 degrees of freedom. You should look up into a statistics textbook about the t distribution to understand what I mean by degrees of freedom, but in a general way, it's the amount of data that I'm using in the experiment. Now, if you plug in the values, we can calculate the t statistic. So we have these values here as for the uh, derivation of the, <clears throat> of the experiment. And when we calculate the t statistic, we have the value minus 1.597. For this confidence level, the critical zone is minus 3.24 to 3.24, which means that under the new hypothesis, uh, there's a 99% chance that the statistic will fall between these two values. So again, we are inside the critical threshold, so we can again conclude that the evidence of the experiment is not strong enough to reject the new hypothesis at this confidence level. Okay, one thing that I want to emphasize is that you do not need to calculate all of these numbers by hand. It's important to understand the principle behind these formulas, but and what these formulas say about the meaning of the statistical tests. But in practice, you will usually create a small script in R or in Python like this one to read your experiment data automatically and calculate the information that you need from the statistical test. Okay, this finishes this second video. In the next video, I want to talk a little bit more about how to interpret the results of the statistical test and the conditions necessary to validate those results. See you there.